I want to start by telling you a little story. Um, come with me on a journey into the past and how that kind of paved the way for a new genetic future. When I was about eight years old, the King Tutankhamun exhibit, the famous Egyptian king, toured the world for the first time. And I had the opportunity to travel with my family. I grew up in Texas. We traveled to um, New Orleans in Louisiana and stood outside in weather very much like the weather out there today in the rain, waiting for several hours for our turn to go in and see these incredible treasures. And I was absolutely blown away. The funerary mask, the chariots. It was like seeing objects that could have been made two weeks before, but they were 3,500 years old. And that instilled in me a fascination with the past that's continued to the present day. I started to devour every book I could, not only in ancient Egypt, but Greece, Rome. I started to expand outward the history of Asia, Africa, and the Americas. And ultimately, of course, started to ask deeper questions about the history of humans. You know, we are taught in school, many of us, that history really starts around 1500. We memorize all of the kings and the acts and so on, but we forget about all the tens of thousands of years of human history that came before that. And that really is what I've devoted my career to, understanding the deeper aspects of human history, really trying to explain the patterns of human diversity that we see around the world today. We're so diverse as a species. You travel, you walk down the street in a major city. You see people who seem to be so different from each other and from ourselves. How did those differences arise? And how did we scatter to the wind to populate the entire planet? That's really what I've focused my career on. Well, historically, to approach these issues, to understand human diversity and human origins ultimately is what we're talking about, we would have gone out and dug things up out of the ground. So the study of paleoanthropology and archaeology, um, digging often skeletons from the ground in, say, East Africa, and guessing on the basis of the morphology of these, often skull shape, this is more likely to be the missing link than that is. But as a geneticist, I was never really satisfied with this because there's so little actual data in paleoanthropology. It gives us lots of fascinating possibilities about our origins, but it doesn't give us the probabilities about direct lines of descent that I, as a budding young scientist, really wanted. Data-driven results. How do we study human origins and human migration patterns over tens of thousands of years using a handful of finds that are often very arbitrary and due to chance? Well, as I was mulling over what I was going to do with my career starting university in the mid-1980s, the field of genetics was undergoing a revolution. And we were just beginning to understand the structure of DNA. DNA sequencing had been invented just a few years before in the late 1970s. Fred Sanger, Wally Gilbert, um, and his colleagues had developed methods of actually determining the sequence of all of the A's, C's, G's, and T's in a genome, initially viruses, Later on, it would be bacteria. But the goal, of course, everyone was thinking about was sequencing a human genome. And that was what excited me the most. DNA is a long linear molecule, the double helix we've all heard about, described by Watson and Crick in 1953, composed of billions of these subunits, A's, C's, G's, and T's, the blueprint to make another version of you. And as the DNA is being replicated or copied to be passed on in every generation, occasionally typos occur, like copying a long text by hand. You'll misincorporate an I for an E, or in the case of DNA, a C for a G. These mutations, as we call them, become markers of descent. And if we share genetic markers, a change in the DNA, with another person, it means we share an ancestor in the past who first had that typo as they were copying their genome and passing it on to the next generation. By studying these markers, we decided we might be able to say something about human origins and help to explain the patterns of human diversity around the world. So again, that is really what I've spent my career studying. It's an extraordinary story. If we go back to Charles Darwin, he, for instance, guessed that humans ultimately had an origin in Africa in common with all of the other great apes because, he posited, chimps and gorillas look more like us than other species. They live there, so we probably came from there. But what about us as a species, not just us as great apes? Where did we come from? Well, that really took DNA to be able to solve. 
And the story that emerged was a shocking one at first. I was just showing um, one of my millennial employees the cover of Newsweek in 1987 when Mitochondrial Eve was first announced. And the shocking story was we all trace back to an African ancestor within the last 200,000 years. And perhaps even more shockingly, it's only in the last 60,000 years that we've scattered to the winds, leaving Africa to populate the entire world. That's only about 2,000 human generations. It's the blink of an eye in an evolutionary sense. So in only 2,000 human generations, we have generated the majority of this diversity that distinguishes us today. We're much more closely related than we ever suspected before we started studying the A's, C's, G's, and T's in the human genome. Well, it was with this in mind, this obsession, armed with the new tools of genomics that were coming along in the late 1990s and early noughts, that we launched the Genographic Project um, 14 years ago, last month, April 13th, 2005. I stepped out on stage, National Geographic headquarters in Washington, D.C., to announce this project to the world. IBM is our partner. It was a $40 million project, very big science for the time. The initial human genome had just been completed, in quotes, because, of course, we're still in the process of completing it in reality. But as I was stepping out onto stage, um, the then CEO of National Geographic pulled me aside 10 minutes before I walked out on stage, and he said, Spencer, we're very excited about this project. The science is so cool. We think we're going to discover so many amazing new things, but this aspect of the project where you're going to be selling DNA testing kits to members of the general public, no one's done that before. We have no idea what the interest will be, but I know consumer behavior, and I got to tell you, no one's going to spend 100 bucks to test their own DNA. If you sell 1,000 of these in the next few years, you'll be lucky. So really focus on the science. Soft pedal the, the, the whole DNA testing thing. And I said, OK, John, name is John Fahey, you're on. So walked down on stage, announced it. And we sold 10,000 of those kits on the first day. We had 100,000 by the end of that year, seven months later. And suddenly, a new industry was born, the industry of consumer genomics which has taken off. Um, really, over the last few years, the companies you might have heard of were created in the wake of that initial success. So again, we launched in 2005, 23andMe, one of the big players now, came out in 2007. Ancestry, which is the dominant player, um, launched their products in 2012. And it's coincided with a really interesting pattern. So if you think back to me starting graduate school in 1989, this debate about whether it's theoretically possible to sequence the billions of nucleotides in a human genome, it took 15 years throughout the whole process of the Human Genome Project, up until about 2001 or so, to sequence one human genome at a cost of $3 billion. So $3 billion, 15 years. Well, the cost of sequencing additional genomes, of course, reduced over time because once you have a scaffold to layer the, the segments of the, the newly sequenced genomes onto, it gets much easier. And it essentially followed Moore's law, the law from computing that says that computer chips are going to roughly double in power um, every 18 to 24 months. And then something happened in 2007, something we called next generation sequencing. And I won't go into detail on what that is, but it effectively involves miniaturizing the process doing it in parallel, billions of reactions going on at a time, microfluidics, et cetera, et cetera. But what that enabled was a sea change in the technology and our ability to sequence genomes. DNA sequencing technology is the most rapidly evolving technology in human history. It has fallen off a cliff. And as you can see from this curve, the cost of sequencing genomes has dropped essentially to zero. It's essentially free compared to that, that first genome. Um, at least. And when things become free, they become ubiquitous. And so what's happened over the last few years in the consumer genomics industry, and this is the U.S. largely, but it's starting to happen in Europe as well, is that the number of people testing has skyrocketed. So at the end of last year, 26 million people in the U.S. had tested their DNA with a consumer testing kit. We're up over 30 million now. These numbers have been doubling for the last two years. So we estimate by the end of 2019, we'll be at 50 million. By the end of 2020, we'll be at 100 million. That's a lot of people. Even at 30 million, though, that's 10% roughly of the U.S. population. Now, what 
people don't realize is that, of course, because we get our genomes from our parents and our grandparents and we pass them on to our children and so on, we share our DNA with a huge cloud of other people out there. And so when we test our own genomes, we're testing the genomes of all of the people that we're related to, out to relatively distant levels of relatedness. Now, if you look at these two curves, the way the cost is dropping and the adoption is going up at an exponential rate, the prediction is, of course, in the future, we will all be sequenced. And this is the vision. I've predicted, other people have talked about this, that within five to 10 years, every child in the developed world will have their genome sequenced at birth, possibly even before, because you can do it non-invasively by drawing the mother's blood now. So in the future, your genomic data will become part of the data cloud that we all carry around with us, just like our credit history or our social media profiles. All of the data that helps to define who we are helps us to make decisions about our lives, and occasionally, when we let people in, allows them to make decisions about us. So this is the grand vision that we were espousing a year ago, and then things started to change in the world of technology. Um, as they famously say, if you're using a product that is feature-packed and it's free and you wonder, you know, how do they do this for free, you are the product, as we began to discover last year. Your data is being used by these large corporations to fund what you're seeing on the front end. And believe me, if you've ever seen Facebook on the back end from an advertiser perspective, it's a very different beast. It's a lot more like a spreadsheet than a nice graphical user interface. So this started to come out last year. People, of course, had known this for a while if you were in the industry, but I think the general public only began to realize this last year. The same thing began to happen in the consumer genomics business. Um, genealogy sites allowing the FBI, in this case, to go in and catch a, a killer from back in the 1970s and 1980s. The case had gone cold, but using the size of these genealogy databases, and looking at the intersection of cousins, you were effectively able to triangulate down to particular individuals, start catching criminals. An inkling that although people may be testing for genealogical purposes, they were in effect creating a huge national DNA database inadvertently, and they were paying for it themselves, which is kind of interesting. These stories continued to come out this year, companies selling access to the FBI, genomic databases without informing the customers, Bloomberg, you know, stories about no one is safeguarding your DNA, the CRISPR babies in China that we've all heard about, and interestingly, China using genetic technologies to profile a minority in Xinjiang, in the western part of the country. These are incredibly powerful technologies, and when incredibly powerful technologies become really inexpensive, they're very easy to misuse. And so people in the last few months have been asking a lot of questions about genomics. I would argue that perhaps the most disruptive technologies of the first half of the 21st century are artificial intelligence, AI, and genomics. AI is going to have a huge impact on society, the nature of work, social relationships, potentially governments, potentially entire economies. Genomics, though, will have a, an intensely um, important impact on us as individuals at a very personal level. So not only will we use genomics to understand who we are in the present and a little bit about our past, but we'll begin to make decisions using these relatively inexpensive and more and more ubiquitous technologies to make decisions about our children, grandchildren, and so on in the future. And with all of this in mind, we have recently formed an institute, the world's first institute, to look into policy and ethical issues focused specifically on personal genomics. So this is not genomics that you might have done in in consultation with your physician in a doctor's office, we're really not focusing on the disease side of things. It's more about these questions of identity and how these simple decisions where you spend 60, 70, 80 dollars or euros on a personal DNA testing kit could have, you know, vastly different um, knock-on effects than you ever suspected when you spit into that tube and send it off. So we'll be announcing this next month, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview of what we're focusing on. But the issue of genomic um, identity and privacy is the very first issue that we think is, you know, the thing that we're going to focus on initially. Thank you very much.